Welcome back to the second module of this course on community rights and forest governance. So far in this module, you have learned the laws that governments have used to establish control over Indian forests and the laws that govern how governments determine the purposes towards which forests are used. Now, whether the purpose is a forest related one, such as improving the timber yield, or a so called non forest purpose, such as clearing the forest to build a mine or a dam, we learned that these decisions are taken under the supervision of the state and the central governments. But we also noted that local communities have a voice in the whole process. We will learn more about the laws that require the needs of communities residing in and on the fringes of forests to be a factor in deciding what forests and forest land are used for. But before we do that, we must first learn about how these communities negotiated for their needs with governments that often had quite different ideas about what to do with forests. As we have learned in the first module of this course, the British approach to forest governance was largely custodial. This meant that the government would first take control of forest land and then harness those lands in the pursuit of industrialization and trade, largely through the cultivation of timber. So the uh entire period starting from the British takeover of India's forests, we see a series of social movements in response to this kind of uh, state intervention in the relationship between people and their forests. You have, uh, as, Mad as Ramchandra Guha has documented, in Uttarakhand, a series of very violent protests in the late uh, 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, where people even burned the forest that they were originally using and, and protecting because the British had taken it over. Uh, consequently, after a, a series of these rebellions or a series of these uh, protests, the Britishers finally had to bend and in Kumau in particular, they passed the one panchayat, uh, 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 not exactly a law, but uh, a component of the existing Land uh, Revenue Act, where they created the space for communities to uh, apply for and take control of community forests that they were, uh, so that they could actually manage it themselves. But this is an exception. You know, in the Kumau hills, there was in fact a, what they call the Sal Assi agreement under uh, Sal Assi settlement, hmm? uh, under which the villagers had ex extensive community uh, 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 common property rights in the what they call Bay Nap Zameen, hmm? which is basically common lands. There was Nap Zameen, which was the private lands, and Bay Nap was the common lands. And then the British came and they started reserving these forests. And uh, when they did this the first time, I think it was 2011 to 2016-17 or so, there were massive conflicts, you know, because suddenly, you know, the uh, government set up the forest department and these male forest guards started, uh, you know, preventing women who were the main users of the forest going to the forest to collect fodder and uh, grass and leaves, etc. So there were terrible conflicts. And in fact, uh, the villagers, you know, were furious, livid at their women being humiliated by these male guards and their rights being, uh, you know, curtailed like that. And uh, and they, they could also see that, you know, the, the British were more interested in the commercial pine trees, whereas the villagers wanted the oak trees, which give good fodder. And uh, so they said, OK, if you're going to do this, we, we are going to set, set your pine forest on fire. Such exceptions occurred in different parts of the countries in different ways. In Jharkhand, for example, uh, the British was uh, quelled the Birsa Munda rebellion, but realized that they would never be able to really control the forestry landscape. And they created the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act, where they gave certain rights to communities uh, uh, to manage their forests pretty much on their own. In the Western Ghats, although there weren't violent protests, there were still very well organized protests because these were much more educated communities. They had more access to the legal system. And there were a lot of protests for, uh, against this takeover and these were better off communities. So the, Brit uh, the Britishers gave concessions in the form of individual privileges to farmers who owned certain kinds of cultivated land to, uh, to also access uh, 
uh, forest land to meet their needs because the farmers made a very strong argument that the, the productivity of agriculture and therefore of course the revenue that the British has got from agricultural land would depend upon their access to forest for produce that would be feeding into the agricultural productivity. So you see therefore a variety of things going on in the landscape wherein pockets because of these protests, because of these uh, the opposition to by certain local communities, some concessions are given. But overall, you still see that the uh, forest is under state control. The one panchayat system in Kumau and the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act are among the products of negotiations between local communities and the colonial government. They recognized as exceptions to the general control of the government over forests many of the historical rights of communities over forests, such as their rights to harvest products of the forest and their rights to graze cattle. Let's now move to understand how communities negotiated for their rights with the governments of independent India. The context for these negotiations is the rapid expansion of the area under the control of the governments. The government's priority was to develop productive forests that could be harnessed for national goals. In several cases, the government was criticized for the improper use of the Indian Forest Act to acquire areas with extensive recorded rights, such as community land and village forests, without any proper settlement of those rights. The legal context, however, for lands being acquired in this fashion had changed. Tribal lands in independent India, as we will learn in the next lecture, were protected under the new constitution. When areas were designated as reserve or protected forests, the people historically living and cultivating in or around those areas could be declared encroachers overnight. The laws that we learnt in the previous lectures of this module, which were often used improperly, treated their presence on the forest and their use of forest resources as a crime. Conflicts between communities and the forest departments broke out in several parts of India during the 1970s. In the 1970s, you have the Chipko Andolan. So, Chipko Andula is in a sense resurrecting that problem. It is saying that the, our forests which were gone were not returned to us. Because remember that the one panchayat uh, solution only happened in the Kuma part of Uttarakhand. And in the Gadwal region of Uttarakhand, one panchayats were not set up. The uh, Chipko Andolan is in the central Gadwal portion of uh, Uttarakhand, where interestingly the local community had set up a cooperative society to manufacture uh, wood based products. And so they had applied for a contract to actually access the timber in, in their local forest. Uh, the contract, however, was given to a timber contractor from the plains. And, in, in, and when the contractor came to fell the uh, forest, people objected saying, how can he come from somewhere else and fell our forests for profit when we are asking for the access to forests for uh, running our own small scale industry. And so in a sense that uh, the Chipko Andolan was not just about hugging forests because forests are uh, in worshipped or part of an aesthetic uh, consciousness or part of a religious consciousness. The uh, forests were important for people for livelihood needs and people were asking for more control over their forests, more access to forests as a resource for meeting their livelihood needs. Uh, however, the response of the state to the Chipko Andolan was to set up a tighter forest conservation uh, act to stop green felling above a certain altitude, to then pass in the 1980s a Forest Conservation Act, as if the uh, Chipko Andolan was only about preserving forests, not about transferring rights of use of forests to local communities to manage sustainably, but also to use it for their livelihood purposes. Therefore, in a sense, the questions posed by the Chipko Andolan fundamentally were never answered. Uh, forest conservation was seen as a goal, which means reduce the pace of uh, deforestation, reduce the pace of transfer of forest land to agriculture, for example, but not that here people are asking for a right to the forest as a resource and to control that resource rather than allowing a state forest department to exploit it for revenue purposes. The increasing population of forest dwelling communities who had no stake in the management and protection of forests and could not meet their needs for forest products came into conflict with the forest administration in the 1970s. But the period also marked the beginning of the break with the official state policy of custodial forestry. On the one hand, the Wildlife Protection Act came into existence. As we have learnt in the first module of this course, many wildlife conservationists believe that the best approach to the conservation of wildlife is through the creation of so-called inviolate spaces, that is, forest areas from which human beings and human activity are excluded by law. The Wildlife Protection Act as we have learned earlier in this module, 
adopted an approach to conservation that required restrictions on the use of forests by people living in and around these forests. The use of this law to declare areas as national parks and wildlife sanctuaries often ended or severely restricted customary rights over those areas. As we have discussed in the first lecture of this course, this model of conservation, known as the protected area model, places a high cost on people dwelling in these areas. Around the same time, the subject of forest was moved through a constitutional amendment into the concurrent list of the constitution. This meant that even though both the union and the state governments could make laws on forests, a union law would prevail over a state law in case of a conflict. The union government used its new powers to pass the Forest Conservation Act. This law, as we have learned, put in place a procedure that had to be followed for the use of forest land for non-forest purposes. The strict application of this law meant that even when governments wanted to give the stamp of legitimacy to communities living in areas that had been declared as reserved or protected forests, they could not do so without following the procedure that it had laid down. Even any process of recognizing rights that already existed hit this legal roadblock because it came to be treated as a diversion for a non-forest purpose. On the other hand, there was an acknowledgement in civil society and in some state governments of the role that local communities could play, particularly in the regeneration of degraded forests, if the economic incentives such as a share in the forest produce were provided. In 1987, the Prime Minister's address to the meeting of the Central Board of Forestry stressed the need for effective people's participation in forest protection and management. That meeting also resolved, among other things, that every village will have a plan for regeneration of forests and the restoration of ecological balance drawn up and implemented with the full participation of village panchayats or other such bodies. The forest policy of 1988 emerged on the scene in this context. Its main objectives were the maintenance of environmental stability and restoration of ecological balance, soil and water conservation, conservation of natural heritage and genetic resources, increasing substantially forest or tree cover, 33% of the land mass and 66% in hills, increasing the productivity of forest to sustainably meet first local and then national needs, creating massive people's movements to increase and protect forest and tree cover, and subordinating the deriving of economic benefit to these principal aims. It said that the holders of customary rights and concessions in forest areas should be motivated to identify themselves with the protection and development of forests from which they derive benefits. The rights and concessions from forests should primarily be for the bona fide use of the communities living within and around forest areas, especially the tribal. It also said that the life of tribal and other poor living within and near forests revolves around forests. The rights and concessions enjoyed by them should be fully protected. Their domestic requirements of fuel wood, fodder, minor forest produce and construction timber should be the first charge on forest produce. Further, a primary task of all agencies responsible for forest management, including the forest development corporations, should be to associate the tribal people closely in the protection, regeneration and development of forests as well as to provide gainful employment to people living in and around the forest. Following the policy, in 1990, the Ministry of Environment and Forests issued detailed guidelines for people's involvement in forest conservation and management through an appropriate village-level organization. It also laid emphasis on the procedure for sharing usufrux and a share of the net sale proceeds. Joint Forest Management, or JFM, emerged as an approach and program in the context of the National Forest Policy of 1988. Under JFM programs, state forest departments support local forest dwelling and forest fringe communities to protect and manage forests and share the costs and benefits from the forest with them. With this new participatory management approach, local people were elevated on paper to the status of co-managers over a designated area of forest along with forest personnel. It brought to focus the need for the equitable sharing of benefits and forest management systems that ensured that local needs for forest produce were met. This challenged forest departments to reorient their perspectives so that they became community facilitators. Their planning processes had to evolve to become participatory.
their objectives had to include the multiple uses of forests and they had to improve their understanding of the ecological and economic role of non timber forest produce as well local institutions too had to apportion responsibilities develop internal rules and practices distribute benefits manage funds and savings and organize marketing and processing enterprises but the approach also had some fundamental problems you have the launching of the joint forest management program in the 1990s with a lot of pushing and prodding uh, by donor agencies particularly the british uh, dfid uh, and also then the world bank came in in a big way and made joint forest management as a condition for giving loans to the forest sector uh, uh, lo uh, lending that they were doing and that prodded the government to start uh, pushing for joint forest management programs across the country unfortunately the joint forest management programs ended up being co-opted by the forest departments they were controlled pa participatory forestry where the nature of participation the space for participation the extent of uh, uh, rights that the people had were all controlled by the forest department there was no statutory support for it and it was not really meant to be anything more than an extension of what the forest department would anyway want to do in the landscape so therefore really it did not change the relationship and in the meanwhile you have the supreme court hearing the godavarman case and passing orders across the landscape on a variety of issues related to forests really expanding the scope of the case beyond the original question of where the forest conservation act would be applicable or not applicable as a result of which of a particular observation made by the court in 2001 and 2002 february uh, the uh, the ministry of environment asked the forest departments to start evicting forest dwellers from what was supposedly encroached lands and that triggered a whole series of evictions which in response to which there came a whole series of protests from the grassroots against this kind of uh, you know action against encroachers so this whole encroachment question which had been in a sense sidelined or neglected for several decades perhaps for a very long period uh, had re resurfaced in the 2000 period because of this very strong drive to evict them jfm programs did not directly address the problem of communities not feeling secure on land that they had historically lived on. They did not permanently improve their rights over the land or their rights to forest resources or give legal recognition to any of their customary institutions for the management of forests. In the early 2000s, in spite of nearly two decades of JFM programs, these issues came to the fore once again. With the involvement of the Supreme Court in the 1990s, the application of the Forest Conservation Act became even stricter. Even land that merely fit the dictionary meaning of the term forest could now only be diverted for a non-forest purpose under that law. This affected the rights of millions of people living and cultivating on those lands. Following an observation by the Supreme Court, the Union Ministry of Environment and Forests kicked off an action in several parts of the country to forcibly remove from forests people who had been labelled encroachers. In 2002, uh, an application was filed in the Supreme Court by the then Amicus Curie in the forest case, which is actually the Goda Varman case. And in that application, the Amicus said that uh, there are a large number of encroachments in forest areas. These for encroachments need to be removed. And uh, the one of the prayers he sought was that this process of regularization of encroachments should be stopped. Unfortunately, while issuing the uh, notice on the application of the amicus, the Supreme Court had also directed that uh, there would be an interim stay in terms of prayer A, which basically the court was saying, if you decode that, is that there would be a stay on regularization of encroachments and it was an interim stay. I suppose the court wanted to hear the other sides and hear the state governments and examine the issue in some detail. What really happened is, is, is symptomatic of what the, uh, the, uh, the relationship of the Adivasi communities and the forest dwelling communities continues to be even today with the state, which is that the state completely misrepresented and misrepre misinterpreted this order of the Supreme Court to mean that, uh, that and represented it to be an order of eviction. And actually, the Central Ministry of Environment and Forest issued a notification to all the state governments saying that the Supreme Court has directed that all encroachments must be removed within a period of nine months. And tragically, 
a number of encroachments in fact running into lakhs i think 150 uh, thousand households 150000 uh, hectares of forest land were cleared in that uh, short period of time and uh, uh, and these these evictions took place in a extremely brutal manner the forest departments accompanied with the uh, police came in with elephants they destroyed uh, people's homes they set fire to their crops they uh, there was a lot of brutality people uh, were you know running away into the forests to escape the kind of uh, brutality they were facing and obviously there was an upsurge of of opposition to this from across the country from across tribal areas in the country and it's at that point of time that the many different discrete tribal rights movements forest rights movements in the country who had until now been pretty much disconnected from each other they came together to form a federation and in a very very united manner they start demanding that there has to be a change in the law and these you know uh, little uh, fragmentary approaches of having one circular here and one change in the national pol forest policy there these things are not going to work we need statutory changes some evictions started in some states and there were massive protests you know all over the place which led to all kinds of uh, grassroots movements coming together meeting in delhi protesting against it and uh, this was around 2003 you know it started later in 2002 the evictions etc and uh, um and then it brought together you know people who were familiar with the forest law etc which included people like me and it brought together people who had already been working on you know preventing evictions etc people like pradeep prabhu and all who in uh, maharashtra had already earlier protested against evictions and got some order from the maharashtra government so then we all came together and uh, uh, this also brought to the surface which for someone like me you know who had been working on joint forest management and what not for many years I I was totally unaware of these 1990 orders which had been issued by MOEF which talked about regularizing pre 1980 encroachments so to speak it also talked about you know rights not having been um, recognized in areas where no proper forest settlements had been done and a number of other orders of of converting forest villages into revenue villages and all of us were totally unaware of this you know we'd been working on gfm for years but we weren't aware about these things dealing with rights so then the first demand was that these orders should be implemented the action against encroachment brought together forest dwelling communities from across the country they came together to agitate for more secure rights to live on and use the land that they have historically lived on and used their demands were not only for the legal recognition of rights over land under settled cultivation but also over their rights to forest resources and the empowerment of their traditional institutions for governance this led to the passage of a remarkable law the forest rights act well you know i think the unique thing about the fra was that it was born out of many regional or state based movements which came together under a national platform for the first time ever you know you had struggles before they were like there was a big struggle in andhra pradesh there was a big struggle in uttarakhand there was a big struggle in uh, chatisgarh you know in different places but they were they remained localized and this was i think for the very first time ever that these issues came up at the national level so in lots of ways uh, uh, you know they want the the way the law was drafted you know the decision was taken in uh, 
January 2005 and we actually had a draft ready within a month. Who is an encroacher? In plain language, an encroacher is a person who exercises rights such as the right to occupy some land or the right to cultivate on that land or the right to harvest from plants growing on that land without actually having those rights under law. Earlier in this module, we learned how people who once had rights to live in and cultivate in forested landscapes and harvest forest produce lost those rights through failures in the processes of law. Their continued settlement and cultivation on those lands amounted to encroachment. In this video, we have learned how communities living in and on the fringes of forests have negotiated with governments for their rights to live in and use those forests. During the colonial period, their agitation led to the recognition of some of their rights to use forests in various pockets of India. In independent India, the conflicts of the 1970s resulted in the National Forest Policy of 1988 and the JFM program. And in the 2000s, the Forest Rights Act was passed. In the next two lectures, we will learn more about this law and the other laws that require local communities to be a participant in the governance of forests. But before we conclude this video, a brief word from one of our experts on why such negotiations never really happen in the northeastern regions of India. So you see, for example, in the northeast, the uh, economic status of those communities is much better because they have had control over the resource, they have never lost control over that resource uh, uh, and the, of course the government has invested a lot in the development of the northeast uh, starting from the colonial period when Christian missionaries went there in a big way. In the northeastern states of India, the forest dwelling communities never lost their rights to the forest land and produce. Communities continue to exercise the rights they had under customary laws that even received the protection of the constitution of India under the sixth schedule. These customary laws also have their critics, but we will not deal with those criticisms in this course. Thank you for watching.